ክብራትን ክብራንን ናይ ዓለም ለኸ ሰላምን ፍትህን ትግራውያን ካፖሎት ኮንፈረንስ ዝመሳኹም ኳድ ሓንተጻሓፍኩ ድሕሪ ክልተ ደቃይቅ ስለን ጅምር ፕሮግራምና ኣብዚ ብኽብሪ ተዓዲምኩም ንዚ ኮንፈረንስ እዚ ብሰላማዊ መንገዲ ንምክትታል መጺኹም ዘለኹም ኩሎም ክብረት ይሃበልና ኳድ ሓንተጻሓፍኩም ብጣዕሚ ዓበይተ ጋይሽና ክቡር ፕሬዝዳንት ጌታቸው ረዳ ኩቡር ማይክል ሃመር ናይ ስፔሻል ኢንቮይ ሆርን ኦፍ አፍሪካ ኩቡር ናይት ፒስ ኤንድ ጀስቲስ ፎር ትግራይንስ ፕሬዝዳንት ፕሮፌሰር ሙልጌታ ገብረዝ ጋብሄር ኩቡር ፓትሪክ ዋይት ፓናሊስት ውን ሌክቸረር አት ኦክናጋን ኮሌጅ ኤግዚኪቲቭ ኢዲተር ኤንድ ኢትዮጵያን ኢንሳይት ኩቡር አቶ የማነ ዘራይ አሶሲየት ፕሮፌሰር ኮሚሽን ኮሚሽነር አብ ትግራይ ክብርቲ ክርስቲና ናይ ኤችፒኤን ፎር ትግራይ ክብርቲ ሪታ ካህሳይ ኩብራት ናይዚ ፒስ ኤንድ ጀስቲስ ፎር ትግራይንስ ኢንተርናሽናል መተሓባበርትን ዓበይት መራሕትን አብዚ ዘለኹም ኩሎም ሕዝን ጅምሮ ፕሮግራም አይተ ፒተር ሃጎስ ናይ ፒስ ኤንድ ጀስቲስ ፎር ትግራይንስ ሴክሬተሪ ንኹብር ፕሬዝዳንት ናይዚ ኦርጋናይዜሽን እዚ ብኽብሪ ዕድመልና ናይተ ሃጎስ ናይተ ፒተር ሃጎስ ብኽብሪ ዕድም ዊዝን 1 ሚኒት ማለት ዩ ኢን አባውት ሚኒት ተዳሊ ኻጽና ናይተ ሃጎስ ኤግዛክትሊ አዋን 10 ኤኤም ፓሲፊክ ስታንዳርድ ታይም ስለን ጅመር ማለት ዩ ፕሊስ ዌልኮም our distinguished uh, participant here and um, high officials from uh, United States of America from Tigray high officials and all participants of diaspora welcome to the first and uh, peace and justice for Tigrayans international conference now uh, mr peter hagos will be taking the speaker to introduce our president and then we will officially start the program thank you so much please take the speaker Aita Hagos Peter Hagos uh thank you uh Ephraim uh thank you so much uh let me make sure that uh, our submit guests are have arrived um Professor Mulgeta do we have all our guests yes welcome uh, president Geta Choreda welcome uh Great. Uh, Mike okay. Hammer, they are already. Right. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first conference on uh, peace building and justice for Tigray, the path forward organized by PJT International. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Hagos Gabra, and I'm the founding member and secretary of PJT International, along with my colleagues. I founded this organization to contribute our share towards peace building and ensuring justice in Tigray in the years ahead. What we have embarked on is a continuation of our advocacy work for the past three years to stop the war in Tigray. Thank you for participating in this conference focused on the path forward for peace building and justice in Tigray. Indeed, you have taken your valuable time to join this conversation on your weekend. We appreciate it and seek to be brief but profound in our exchange today. Without further ado, ado I now hand over the floor to our founding president, Professor Mulgeta Gabagzabher, who will introduce our esteemed speakers. Thank you. Take, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Peter Gabra. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, we have distinguished guests. Uh, Mr. Gita Choreda, President of the Tigray Interim Regional Administration. We have also Ambassador Mike Hammer, Special Envoy for, no for Horn of Africa for President Biden. And I also see his colleague, Ms. Nora Dempsey. Welcome. Dear 
distinguished speakers, panelists, and attendees. Dear colleagues, I also see the chair of my department, Dr. Hermes Flores. Thank you so much. As uh, it was introduced by my colleague, my name is Mulgeta Gebrek uh, and I am really honored to provide some opening remarks as president of Peace and Justice for Tigrayans or PJT International. This is a young organization established to harness the expertise and experience of the Tigray diaspora for peace and justice in Tigray and beyond. As some of you may know, I have been working on issues of war and peace and public health for the past few years. I have published op-eds in international print media such as The Hill, appear on international media such as the UK's Hard Talk and newspapers in Italy, Japan, Germany, among other hundreds of engagements. I have also co-authored scientific articles in The Lancet, BMJ, and other leading peer reviewed journals on the topics of war and its impact on public health. In fact, the American Public Health Association has recognized me for outstanding contributions to preventing war and promoting international peace by awarding me the Victor Seidel and Barry Levy uh, Award for Peace. As a continuation of my efforts to engage with fellow members of the Tigray diaspora, I have joined hands with other Tigrayans to establish PJT International, a nonprofit organization working to advocate for peace and justice in Tigray, Ethiopia, and beyond. While we have been working on advocacy efforts and research to promote the cause of peace and justice, this is our first major conference, and the turnout is beyond our wildest expectations. It shows the yearning of our community to peace, justice, in Tigray. Our work is just beginning. We all know that the past four years were the worst time in Tigray's history with social, economic, and political crisis due to the genocidal war waged on Tigray. The aftermath of the war is still causing unimaginable suffering for the people of Tigray, especially those who are displaced from their homes and those suffering from the unfolding fun. As an advocacy organization, PJT International believes that during this unique period of Tigray's history, the diaspora must continue to contribute towards the attainment of peace, justice, and accountability, as it did during the fight for survival in the past three years. It should continue to collaborate with friends of Tigray and in institutions that promote peace and justice for anyone without discrimination. In this regard, while we were hopeful about the international community's effort to document the war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and genocide committed against the Tigray people, with the recent conclusion of the mandate of the International Commission for Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia, we are worried that our people may not get full justice. PJT International does not believe that the victims of the war can get justice through the current approach of transitional justice mechanisms being led by the Ethiopian government. Moreover, the lack of transparency in the transitional justice process and the absence of an agreed roadmap to deliver justice to the victims of genocide and war crimes are of great concern. Thus, this conference aims to be one platform for the following. One, open a constructive discourse on these pertinent issues of peace building and justice, charting a path forward to achieve peace and full justice. And thirdly, harnessing the diaspora and friends of Tigray to contribute towards peace and justice. PJT International is ready to collaborate with organizations with similar goals, respective of region, color, religious, or other differences. Let me end my remarks by quoting Albert Einstein. Those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And in that action are the seeds of new knowledge. I thank you very much. 
So again, uh, I would like to welcome uh, our distinguished guests. Uh, and I will share my screen quickly so that I can introduce my guests. Uh, I will start. Give me a second. I will start uh, with our distinguished uh, guest, Ambassador uh, Michael uh, Hammer. As uh, many of you know, I'm trying, yeah. As many of you know, um, Ambassador Mike Hammer, uh, and I, we are so elated and uh, happy that you joined this community who is worried about their families and friends uh, uh, in, in Tigray and in the region. <clears throat> Ambassador uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Hammer is the United States Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa since June 1, 2022. His over three decades of service include serving as acting senior vice president of the National Defense University. He served as US ambassador to many countries and uh, as a public servant in several capacities that include assistant secretary of state for public affairs, White House as a special assistant to the president, among other senior roles. Ambassador Hammer has received several awards, including the department's Cobb Award for Initiative and Success in Trade Development, the Navy's Distinguished Public Service Award, the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award, the department's Edward Merrow Award for Excellence in Public Diplomacy, and several superior uh, honor awards. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Hammer has master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and from the National War College at the National Defense University. Ambassador Hammer grew up in Latin America, living in Honduras, El Salvador, Colombia, Venezuela, and Brazil. He is a native Spanish speaker and speaks French, Portuguese, and Icelandic. And Ambassador Mike and his wife, Mar Margaret, uh, have three children. And more importantly, related to today's meeting, Ambassador uh, Mike played an instrumental role in the negotiations that led to the signing of the Pretoria Agreement that silenced the guns in Tigray. And I believe he will be shuttling uh, between uh, DC, Addis Ababa, and Mekele to see the fruits of uh, this uh, Pretoria Agreement. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I will open the floor for you uh, for your uh, uh, comments and remarks. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mulligetta, and of course to uh, this new group of uh, Peace, Justice, and Tigray International. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you this morning from California, from Los Angeles, where I met with some uh, uh, Ethiopian diaspora just yesterday and participated in a women's empowerment event for the Horn of Africa. Good afternoon to my friends and colleagues on the East Coast. And of course, uh, good evening to those uh, 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 joining us from Mekele, including uh, my good friend, uh, President Getachew Reda. Um, it is, as you pointed out, uh, something very important in terms of my mandate to work on behalf of the US government to ensure the full implementation of the cessation of hostilities agreement that was reached in November of 2022. Time is passing and yet we are uh, dissatisfied with the progress so far that has been made in implementing the agreement, despite the fact that, of course, it did silence the guns, which was extremely significant, and that we have seen a rather a substantial decrease uh, in human rights abuses in Tigray. And for that, uh, we uh, appreciate all the efforts that are being made, uh, <clears throat> both uh, in Mekele and in Addis, to make sure that the peace endures and that there's a continuing commitment, again, to the full implementation of the agreement. Let me just touch on a few priority areas uh, that we're working on and, again, uh, and reinforce that the U.S. government is fully determined to continue to work to try to bring peace, uh, justice uh, to all uh, Ethiopians. I was in Addis uh, earlier this week and had meetings there with government officials. And I was uh, also in Addis in December when I had an opportunity to meet in person with uh, President Getachew Reda. 
in uh, Addis. And of course, you know that I go to Mekele uh, as often as I can and, as, and that our new ambassador, Irvin Masinga, has also been there and that our USAID team uh, goes up uh, on a regular basis and has meetings with the leadership of the interim regional administration to try to address some of the core key concerns, including uh, issues relating to, to food assistance, um, medical assistance, uh, other needs, and of course, the implementation of the COHA. Uh, we would uh, say that on one of the key issues that we've been pressing forward is in trying to uh, ensure that there's progress in the DDR program, in the demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration, particularly focused on the reintegration part as uh, the uh, interim regional administration has followed through on, on commitments on uh, disarmament and demobilization. Uh, we are pleased that in the United States we have identified funding and we are ready to support a, a program as soon as it is ready. And we've been frustrated that so far we don't have uh, sufficient details, although one that was added earlier this week, I was told that Ambassador Tishome, who is working on this on behalf of the federal government, has provided us additional information. So I hope uh, very much that soon uh, we will be able to start contributing to the implementation of this program. It's an item of discussion that I covered uh, quite thoroughly with uh, President Gattaccio Reda back uh, in December. And that is important for providing reassurance to uh, all of Ethiopia that the uh, peace will hold. And of course, that elements of the, the peace dividend uh, will eventually uh, benefit uh, the Tigrayan people. I will say that we were quite frustrated for several months that we had to suspend uh, food aid deliveries. Uh, as you may have read in the press, uh, it was unfortunate that the largest uh, food aid diversion, perhaps in USAID's history, uh, was occurring in Ethiopia that required us to uh, put a halt to food aid and not something the United States wanted to do. But as you probably well understand, uh, certainly the American taxpayers on this call understand uh, the State Department and USAID has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that uh, monies uh, that are being put forward for uh, assistance uh, are used for its intent. And unfortunately, uh, much of the food that was being distributed was not reaching those in need, but rather was being diverted either for business profit or other were not uh, in keeping with uh, what was needed. Uh, we have now managed to uh, reach an, an arrangement that is satisfactory. So food aid is starting to, uh, again, be delivered. However, we understand and we have seen the comments by uh, President Gattacherita of, of great concern of, of uh, possibilities of starvation. And so uh, we will continue to work on that to, together with many other partners and donors. Uh, you probably are well aware that the United States is the largest uh, donor of, of humanitarian assistance uh, to Ethiopia. We're proud of that fact. Let me also say a word about uh, our efforts to work towards uh, justice uh, and accountability. It is something that uh, our team in Washington, together with our embassy, is working on uh, to try to make sure that there is progress. You're all aware of uh, Secretary Blinken's determination of atrocities committed uh, during the, the Tigray conflict that he uh, uh, issued uh, in March of uh, last year, where he found, of course, uh, several groups, uh, whether it's the uh, ENDF, uh, Eritrean forces, uh, some uh, TDF, and uh, of course, Amhara uh, special forces responsible for in, in varying degrees for uh, atrocities, gross violations of human rights, some of uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So we will speak out when the facts uh, call for it. And we definitely are determined to see accountability. We also continue to call on the complete, complete withdrawal of Eritrean forces from Tigray and uh, are looking for the day when that can be fully realized. Uh, I want to emphasize that none of this, uh, from our perspective, in terms of the engagements with the diaspora would be possible if it weren't for the heroic efforts of my colleague who's also on the call, Nora Dempsey, our senior advisor for diaspora engagement, which reflects the Biden administration's commitment 
to engage with Ethiopians uh, and to hear from you your uh, perspectives, your policy recommendations, and to have exchanges like the one today. I have other commitments uh, today, but she will be re, uh, remaining on the call. And of course, you're always free to reach her and uh, pass along uh, your perspectives. Uh, we are Our policy is informed by the ideas that you share. And I have valued my uh, frequent ex exchanges with the Tigran diaspora, as well as with all the other uh, Ethiopian diasporas that we find uh, here in, in the United States. And rest assured, the United States is committed to trying to resolve some of the very uh, difficult and complex uh, issues uh, that uh, plague uh, Ethiopia uh, through dialogue and that we have offered the federal government both to try to resolve uh, the conflict in Oromia. And you may be aware that I spent several weeks uh, last uh, fall in Tanzania uh, trying to negotiate a peace uh, with the uh, Oromo Liberation Army that uh, unfortunately did not come to fruition yet, but we will continue our efforts and that we are also interested in finding a way to promote a dialogue between the Amhara Fano and the federal government. Again, the United States is keen uh, to advance the, 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 the rights of all Ethiopians and, and to alleviate the suffering of all Ethiopians. And uh, we uh, will remain committed uh, to that effort. Um, uh, there's not enough time today to get into other issues, but uh, of course I was at the uh, EGAD summit in Entebbe, uh, where a subject of discussion was also the recent memorandum of understanding between Ethiopia and Somaliland that is causing tensions between Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, again, we're urging all uh, neighbors and, and countries in uh, the Horn of Africa to focus on delivering for their people and to try to avoid uh, additional conflict, which the region can ill afford. Uh, again, Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me this morning. I very much appreciate the invitation and uh, look forward again to continue to uh, have this dialogue and uh, to my future visits in Mechelen. I hope to visit even more uh, of the beautiful areas in, in Tigray. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Michael Hammer, for the wonderful Professor Mulgeta, let me mute everyone and unmute yourself sorry for a second no. okay go ahead i'm sorry yes uh thank you uh um Ephraim. again uh thank you so much uh, mr ambassador uh we are hopeful that your engagements uh would uh go through very well and um, lead into sustainable peace in Tigray, in Ethiopia, and in the whole region. As uh, Tigrayan-born uh, Americans, we are in support of all your efforts. So yeah. we are also here offering uh, as Tigrayan diaspora uh, that your engagements uh, will be always supported by us. Uh, if you reach out to us, the same way we reach out to you. And I would like really to thank um, Ms. Nora Dempsey uh, for making all these arrangements possible with us. Uh, Ms. Nora uh, has been really uh, a backbone uh, in, in, in our grand diaspora as well as probably other diaspora organizations in her engagement. So I would really, really like to thank her uh, on behalf of my colleagues and the grand diaspora that's here today. Maybe, uh, I know that you are uh, have engagements. You told us uh, already before, so uh, I wish you all the best in everything you do. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Gita Choneda, President of uh, uh, Tira or the Tigra Interim Regional Administration. Uh, I am going to invite him next. Let me share my screen very quickly. Hello, Mr. Bradley. Thank you so much. He used to have a doctor. What would you like? <clears throat> so we are uh, on, on, on time. Uh, our next uh, guest would be uh, President Gita Choreda. Uh, sorry. As you know, uh, Salam Gita uh, Welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, we are 
long time, I think we know each other from Addis Ababa University. I'm so glad that uh, you are addressing us today as president of uh, the Tigray people. Mr. Gita Choreda is current president of uh, the Tigray Interim Regional Administration, and he is also an executive committee member uh, of the Tigray People's Liberation Front. He has served in several capacities, both at the federal and regional levels in Ethiopia. He was advisor, the former president of the Tigray region, and served as the Minister of Government Communication Affairs in the Prime Minister's Office of Ethiopia until 2016. He completed his undergraduate studies at Addis Ababa University's School of Law between 2001 and 2002, which makes us alumni. And he also completed uh, a Master's of Law at Alabama University, Tuscaloosa, the United States. Before taking a government. Unmute yourself again. I'm sorry. Uh, please mute, be disciplined, everyone. This is all much more than we have. the government's position in 2009, he served as a professor of law at Mekele University, located in the capital city of the Tigray region. As you know, he has done all, including sacrificing his life uh, to peace, justice of the Tigray people. He played an instrumental role in the negotiations that led to the signing of the Pretoria Agreement that silenced the guns in Tigray. And currently, as you can see, he is shepherding, uh, has shouldered that responsibility to take it to full effect. Thank you so much again, President Gitacho. Uh, the floor is open for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mamul uh, uh, like you said, we know uh, each other uh, from uh, way back when I was uh, when we were both in college. So, uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to address you all. I I see Mike has already left, uh, but I should nonetheless recognize is here. Uh, how critical is here. role. Oh, really? Is yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mike, uh, in fact, has played a very significant role. In making the uh, uh, Pretoria uh, agreement possible, uh, he achieved uh, that feat despite uh, uh, strong resistance it was from the the federal government, uh, which was not particularly keen on the presence of uh, uh, foreign uh, guarantors or advisors in our uh, in our uh, negotiations. But fortunately, uh, due to his tireless efforts. Uh, he was uh, able to pull off some 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 progress, and I have to once again thank him for his tireless efforts. Like he has particularly uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we have been seeing each other for a long time now. Of course, he has been very instrumental in making sure that the process remains, uh, despite the lackluster uh, progress, especially with regard to the implementation of the most critical aspects of the Pretoria arrangement more particularly the return of IDPs and the restoration of uh, uh, constitutionally mandated territories of Tigray. Uh, I have every reason to believe that uh, Mike will continue to, to be engaged, not, just, not, not, not only as a, a special envoy of the United States, but also more, import, more importantly, a friend of Ethiopia and a friend of Tigray. I know he has been complaining a lot. He has been complaining a lot about Tigrayans making too much noise. Uh, despite their uh, their uh, small numbers, so to speak. Uh, thank you once again, Mike. At, uh, I I missed out on the opportunity to see you last week, but it definitely uh, will 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 uh, not just cross paths, but uh, will will continue to work together and uh, address uh, some of the outstanding issues that we have here. Uh, and also greetings to all uh, distinguished guests, uh, presenters, participants, and brothers and sisters of the Tigrayan diaspora. I would like to, to thank. Professor Mulgeta, president of PGIT, uh, PGTI, uh, and his colleagues for uh, organizing this event, and of course for inviting me uh, to share some of my thoughts with regard to the question of peace and justice uh, in Tigray, in particular, but uh, in in other parts of Ethiopia in general. Like my fellow Tigrayans in the diaspora and friends of Tigray, I am indeed delighted to be able to address. Our friends in the Tigrayan diaspora, our brothers and sisters in the Tigrayan diaspora, regarding their role in peace building efforts currently underway 
and in the years to come. That the diaspora has seen, has been in the forefront of highlighting the cause of Tigray over the last four or so years. And that you've been tireless promoters of the cause of peace and justice for the people of Tigray cannot be overstated. You have been such source of hope for your people and indeed for all of us when the chips were down. We in the Tigray leadership regrettably have been missing in action when it comes to reaching out to the Tigray and diaspora, particularly since the Pretoria Agreement, uh, a failure which I have reason to believe has dearly cost us diplomatically and in other aspects of our endeavors. But as uh, people your side of the Atlantic would say, it is better to be late than never. Brothers and sisters, it's been well over 14 months now since Pretoria was signed. And despite the silencing of the guns in many parts of Tigray and progress in many areas, a lot remains to be done in the full implementation of the agreement and the restoration. The, the return of a million plus IDPs and the restoration of conditionally mandated territories of Tigray, the demobilization and reintegration of tens of thousands of combatants, and sincere rehabilitation, recovery, and reconstruction efforts equal to the level of destruction wrought on Tigray are long overdue. The issue of deepening peace cannot be undertaken unless these priorities are fully and adequately taken care of. Of course, the issue of justice and accountability also comes front and center, without which the peace building efforts will remain incomplete and elusive. I understand peace and justice could be a very difficult mix to manage unless we have a clear understanding of what it takes to build peace without compromising our commitment to justice and accountability. We know the federal government has been working on a transnational justice framework, also as part of the Pretoria Agreement. As uh, Mike would recall, we've been uh, engaging with the federal government on these issues, and of course with our partners, including the U.S. government. Even when I was uh, back, when I was in the U.S. in Washington D.C. Uh, last July, I had the opportunity to raise some of our concerns with regard to the transnational justice framework that the uh, Ethiopian federal government has put in place. It is our contention, uh, and it's also been our communication with the federal government that no matter how robust the transnational justice mechanism, the kinds of crimes committed in Tigray simply render such a framework, even if robust, woefully inadequate. A, trans a transnational justice mechanism cannot help address crimes committed by foreign forces in Tigray. Crimes by Eritrean forces are a key in point. Whatever robust process you put in place, the kinds of crimes, egregious crimes that have been committed by the Eritrean forces cannot be handled in any meaningful fashion unless we have some international component uh, to, to, to uh, justice and accountability in, 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 in what has transpired in Tigray as a result of the genocidal uh, adventure that, that, that claims the lives of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Tigray. Equally important, the framework needs to ensure the fullest possible participation of Tigray in its formulation as well as implementation. A lot remains to be done in this regard, and it is entirely appropriate that, that the, the diaspora should push for introduction of an international component to the question of justice and accountability in this regard. A lot could and should be said in this regard, but it would suffice for me to say that there is a lot that the diaspora should and could do with regard to ensuring peace, justice, and accountability. Brothers and sisters, when I received Professor Mulgeta's invitation to address this forum, Mulgeta, as I have told you, I know him from my college days back in Addis Ababa, I was eager to use this opportunity to once again reconnect with the vibrant Tigrayan diaspora, with a noisy diaspora, to quote Mike, and friends of Tigray, and to share my thoughts on what our expectations are of our people all over the world. Our people are currently facing the specter of famine that could easily append the rather difficult task of healing, peace building, and recovering rehabilitation efforts in Tigray. Our existence as a people is still in jeopardy. Your role in saving your people from such challenge could not be overstated. Of course, you should continue to engage in sustained and coordinated advocacy work, 
uh, building in the areas of peace, uh, justice, and accountability. Economic support to your families, to your friends, to your communities goes without saying could go a long way in elevating problems of poverty at household levels. You could also play a key role in the areas of professional and capacity development in many uh, areas uh, that appear to be absolutely one thing because Tigray, what the conflict in Tigray, what the genocidal campaign in Tigray has done is not just a destruction of infrastructure throughout the country, which is quite, quite enormous, but the destruction of the sub-state structure itself. And one of the most critical challenges we continue to face is that we have to try and work towards uh, bringing the entire state structure back on its feet again. And, and Tigray, which prides itself on having a 3,000 plus history, and which has been the bedrock of Ethiopian civilization, now suffers in a situation where even our state institutions and structure are absolutely one thing. And it requires a concerted effort on the part of not only the, inter the interim administration, uh, but the entire population of Tigray, and more particularly, the participation of our diaspora in making sure that our institutions are back on their feet again. Uh, of course, uh, last but not least, we, we uh, those of us in the government expect the Tigrayan diaspora to play in a very constructive role, peace building efforts through community engagement with other like-minded groups and organizations. Whatever you do in your localities should not remain in your localities. Whatever you do in your respective communities should not remain in respective com communities. To the extent that anything and everything that Tigray and the people of Tigray require needs engagement with other communities, I think you can continue to serve as uh, bearers of that responsibility and it is my hope and expectation that we'll be in a position to discharge responsibilities, responsibilities in a manner that would address uh, the plight of people, our people. I can go on and go on forever, but it would suffice for me here to say that the sky is the limit on your contributions to deepening peace and ensuring justice and accountability. You are our advocates and diplomats, wherever you are, and we cherish that more than anything else. Of course, we cherish that more than any other time in our history. Let me once again take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the event for giving me the chance to mend fence and reconnect with our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Let's keep in touch and make sure uh, not only to invite Mike, who was a reliable friend of the people of Tigray and the people of Ethiopia in general, uh, not only to invite him and to give him a dress down on a number of issues, but also to pick his brain on what uh sort of diaspora engagement i know he's, he's being assisted by nora who's been a very a very uh who has played a very a supportive role throughout and i you like you have put, rightly pointed out you can count on our friends uh in the u.s government uh to make sure that whatever we do uh is done in a manner that uh protects the best interests of the people of the ground once again i would like to take this opportunity to thank all our friends uh, for, for giving this opportunity to address uh, long lost friends and brothers and sisters. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, when I sent uh, an invitation to President Gitacho and I asked him how should I address you because in our college days we used to call him Gecho and he said, I didn't change, just call me Gecho. So that's why he started by saying Muller. Uh, that was also my name. <laughs> when you are in college. So good to see you, my friend. Um, and uh, really, thank you so much for that remarkable uh, address and remarks uh, where you really gave us the roadmap of engagement for uh, the diaspora. Ambassador Mike, like he said, uh, I am one of the noisy diaspora. I tag you all the time on my tweets. <laughs> Uh, so, but it is for a good cause. Uh, thank you so much for all you do um, to help us go through this uh, agony and, and, you know, have peace and justice at the end of the day. So, uh, with, uh, I think we are on time. I uh, hope uh, uh, President Gitacho lingers a little bit more uh, to hear some of the key presentations today. Uh, our next uh, program uh, I will pass it to uh, Mr. Peter Hagos.
Is Mr. Peter here? Uh, you can unmute, uh, unmute him, uh, Ephraim. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, there was a, for the technical problem. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can hear yes, you. We, we can, can hear, hear you. you. Okay. Okay, so uh, the uh, next uh, phase is uh, our... Uh, uh, You've already uh, made uh, opening remarks by uh, uh, Professor Murgeta Gabriel here. Uh, so uh, we now we're going to go to the Professor Murgeta. Uh, Professor Murgeta will uh, give us some uh, additional opening remarks. Uh, Professor Murgeta, uh, the vice chair and uh, for academic programs at Mega at uh, Medical University of South Carolina and president of Peace and Justice of the Great International. Has done research on public health, um, global health, and uh, war prevention in Tigray and other parts of the world. Is the recipient of the Victor Seidel and Barry Demi Award for Peace of his for his outstanding contributions for preventing war and promoting international peace by the American Public Health Association. His fellow like a Hall of Fame of the American Social Association. He's founder of the leader of Impactful Humanitarian Organization. More importantly, his father and husband. Professor Mulgeta, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, Mr. Hagos, are you Hagos? You call him a Hagos? So I am going to just, uh, you know, as I indicated in, the, in my opening remark, we have really speakers with diverse backgrounds, gender-wise, geography-wise, experience-wise, as well as in terms of expertise. And we will be addressing today issues of justice, both transitional and full justice and accountability, roles of the Pretoria Agreement and the suspension of ICRI, challenges and prospects in the Tigray Genocide Inquiry Commission, and also about harnessing the power of the diaspora in bringing peace uh, and justice. So to give you some background, uh, like it was stated in the bios, we have been really working on issue of Tigray and even broadly, uh, you know, the Horn of Africa for a long time now. <clears throat> uh, but things change over time. So as things shift, we have to also evolve and change our uh, approach, our methods to dealing uh, the prevailing issues. So PJTI or PJT International was founded as a 501c3 uh, registered in the US to harness the diverse expertise and experiences of the Tigray diaspora and friends of Tigray to contribute towards sustainable peace through dialogue, implementation of the roadmap for justice and accountability. And we'll talk about that roadmap uh, in our uh, presentations. Upholding territorial integrity of Tigray, return of the internally displaced peoples to their homes, resolution of the humanitarian crisis, full representation of Tigray at the federal government while agreeing also to constitutional arrangements and strong influence of Tigray in regional and international uh, agenda. Our really mission and vision is to see a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous, uh, prosperous Tigrayan society where justice and human rights are respected through multifaceted involvement of Tigrayans, both in Tigray and in the diaspora, as well as involving or partnering with uh, friends of Tigray, like we are doing uh, right now. There are four pillar goals uh, in, in our um, portfolio. Uh, at, at least in the coming few years, we will be working on these four pillars. Uh, one is we will be advocating for peace and justice, and of course, respect of human rights for Tigrayans using local, national, and international platforms. We will work to advance peace building efforts in Tigray and beyond to achieve our mission. 
And we will also be advancing initiatives to build free civil societies and towards building democratic institutions in Tigray and beyond. And more importantly, we will collaborate with local international organizations to harness their resources to achieve our mission, as uh, President Gitacho also addressed. This is also what we are doing today already. Uh, at, at, at the start, we are already uh, doing some of these pillar goals. And in terms of objectives, we will support the documentation and dissemination of information on conditions of human rights and justice in Tigray and beyond. One of the uh, institutions that we hope we collaborate with uh, is speaking today. Organize trainings and workshops to civil societies on advocacy, peace building, and justice in Tigray and beyond. Support civic and civil societies as foundations of peace and justice in Tigray and beyond and facilitate scholarship opportunities to emerging leaders with the potential to advance the culture of democracy in Tigray and beyond, and also to promote debate societies as foundations of peace and justice in Tigray and beyond, and finally, promote the role of youth and women in the advancement of peace uh, and justice. I would like uh, to thank so many people in helping us organizing this. Uh, Sarah Tadios for amazing, uh, who is an amazing planner and organizer. The experts uh, groups, uh, we call them the Tigray Digital Forces. They are amazing advocacy who have been helping us. And of course, my wife, Abby, who is my uh, college sweetheart and my two sons and also my two cats who have always read uh, the JAMA article as you can see with me on my desk. And of course, my colleagues of uh, PJT International and friends. Uh, I think with that, uh, I end my presentation. I have us back to you. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, sorry for the technical uh, back and forth. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Yamana uh, Zarai Masfin, okay. uh, who is uh, currently heading the, the uh, Commission of Inquiry of the Great Genocide, is the Commissioner for uh, Commission of the Inquiry of the Great Genocide. Mr. Yamana Zarai Masfin is an associate that has uh, served as an associate professor of political science at Macaulay University. He has also served at different positions of academic research, consultancy, community services, and administration uh, and uh, and administrative posts at Macaulay uh, at Macaulay University for more than twenty years. Uh, Mr. Yamana, uh, please, uh, 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 very welcome, uh, and uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Unmute him, Efren. Uh, Yaman uh, is all right. Okay. There you go. I did ask him to unmute himself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, good evening. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, PJ, PJ, uh, PJTI, for uh, inviting me uh, to present my uh, uh, views. Uh, and also distinguished uh, guests, thank you very much. Uh, my presentation would be on towards justice and accountability on efforts and challenges in the Tigray uh, genocide investigation. Uh, let me start my uh, presentation by sharing you a very brief uh, 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 story uh, on the Enine massacre. Enine. Uh, uh, we call it Enina uh, in Tigrinya. Uh, it's found in Igdalawarada district of central Tigray, which is a very small rural village of about 345 residents. And it has lost its 62 civilian residents, which make 18% of its total population. In a single day of October 23, 
2022. That means uh, before uh, a month uh, before the Pretoria Agreement, by a direct shooting of Eritrean soldiers who detained the victims for two days, taking the victims from their uh, hideouts and uh, homes. This is one of the thousands of investigations and thousands of massacres uh, uh, and atrocities committed uh, in Tigray. Now, uh, let me come to uh, the major agenda that is the challenge on uh, truth finding and investigations uh, in Tigray. And then uh, I will uh, try to uh, share you uh, some practical uh, cases and uh, some statistical figures that we have found as uh, a commission just to show uh, uh, the gravity of atrocities and uh, uh, the positions uh, uh, where the Tigray people is living. Uh, the first challenge is uh, that no national and international media coverage uh, is allowed officially on these issues uh, of uh, atrocities committed in Tigray. Uh, you all know that national medias are not allowed to talk about it, and international medias are not still allowed to enter Tigray uh, officially. Uh, so that is one thing. The second one is no national and international independent investigation uh, is allowed uh, yet. Uh, UN ICRI, as we all know, and other international investigators are forbidden to investigate on the ground. The so-called joint investigation carried out in 2021 by Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and UN Higher Human Rights Commission was totally hijacked by uh, the Ethiopian government and no independent local uh, civil society or others uh, are involving on uh, this uh, issue. Uh, the third one is uh, uh, the probably the challenge on uh, the ground. Uh, we all, you all know that there are uh, so many areas which are not accessible uh, uh, to uh, anybody uh, who wanted to have a look at either uh, from here. Western Tigray totally uh, is in the shadow. Southern, Northwestern, Central, Eastern Tigray districts and localities still are under occupation and problems are still uh, occurring and continuing. The genocide acts are continuing. Security problems during the war was a major challenge uh, uh, for any uh, institution, including our commission to work properly uh, uh, during uh, the direct two years war. And we have logistical and capacity problems uh, 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 in every aspect. Uh, you all know that uh, government structures were targeted uh, uh, by uh, the perpetrators. So uh, government uh, structures from the top up to the locality uh, is a victim by uh, itself. So uh, as its reflection, we as uh, established by uh, the government and every uh, institution are also uh, in, working in a very weak uh, uh, position. However, still with uh, the help of uh, 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 voluntary participation of uh, the people, and also uh, just striving uh, efforts, we have uh, uh, tried to get uh, as much uh, evidence and document, uh, so uh, many evidences as much as uh, uh, possible. That's, uh, uh, and I will uh, show you uh, some uh, statistical and uh, evidences uh, from that. What are we, uh, what have we assessed? Uh, we have assessed more than 31,000 private and uh, private firms. Uh, with regard to social initiatives, we have assessed 969 self-help associations, eight big mass associations, 749 religious sites, of which 195 are seriously damaged and investigated. Uh, with public sector or government initiatives, 1,623 public schools, 934 public health facilities, 12 public infrastructure institutions and 33 public administration office of the Tigray government. On household finding, we have assets 657, 157 households or families which, with a profile of more than 2,458,000 people or family members. And we have also have more than 4,000 4, deep investigations in human atrocities and GBV uh, cases. It is from these 4,000 uh, investigations uh, that I have shared you 
uh, that little uh, but very serious uh, massacre uh, on uh, enemy. What have we found? At least on the household, we found that statistically uh, 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 analyzed one that I am uh, presenting, 86.94% of household asset is severely damaged, severely uh, damaged. That means more damage, more than 75%. Uh, 80% of the household assets are intentionally looted. And so fully damaged houses constitute 31% of the assessed uh, household. The, the assessed houses, that means the more than 657,000 uh, uh, houses, 31% of them are fully damaged, and 49% are partially uh, damaged by uh, the war and uh, its effect. Come to the household crop farming, 94% crop farm equipment are severely damaged, burned, or looted. 96% of crop farm input, inputs are damaged, looted, or burned. And if we see animal farm on the household level, 82% animal looted, slaughtered, or killed. 90% of animal feed is damaged, burned, or looted. More than 84% animal farm equipment is damaged, burned, or looted. More than 90% animal farm input is damaged. More than 89% animal medical service is damaged. Even Tigray is known by uh, its honey production, and 70% of the bee colony uh, is damaged. This is on the household level. To come to the sectoral uh, area, we have assessed, uh, as I have told you, investments, public institutions, support sectors. On the agriculture sector, more than 70% of the agricultural firms that we have assessed report severe, uh, uh, medium and severe damage. More than 83% of the manufacturing sector uh, have reported uh, medium and severe uh, damage. More than 85% of the service sector have reported medium and severe uh, damage. And more than 91% of the trade sector have uh, uh, reported uh, uh, medium and severe damage. More than 67% of the financial sector, including banks, microfinance, uh, insurance, and uh, public finance supporting institutions, uh, have reported 67.7% of medium and severe damage. And on the public health sector, more than 88% of uh, the public health sector uh, is damaged. And on the education sector, 78% uh, of damage uh, is reported. So more than 69% of Tigray heritage, even on the heritage side, heritage suffer different type of and levels of uh, damage. So from this, we have analyzed that what, what microeconomic impacts uh, can be seen, which has led uh, the current uh, status of the people, including the current famine uh, uh, to the people of Tigray. People with any damage type constitute more than 77% of the population. Displaced people due to the war with Tigray are 61% of the people. That means who stayed out of, out, out of uh, their house for an average of more than 100 days. That means in the different areas, especially in the eight months where uh, uh, the Ethiopian uh, forces with their allies uh, and uh, foreign uh, forces, uh, people were uh, coming out of their uh, uh, house in uh, for different uh, uh, periods. So uh, people were being displaced from a place to place, from one locality to the other, from one district to the other, from one city to the other. So this has uh, greatly affected production and life uh, of the people. Displaced people due to the war to Sudan constitute 99,229 uh, people. So poor people in the post-war uh, uh, area has be, uh, been recorded to be 91.13% of the population. Before the war, uh, uh, poverty was about 29%, uh, uh, but now 91.13% uh, of the population uh, is considered to be uh, uh, in the poverty. So food insecure people constitute more than 
82% of the population. And these figures can show you uh, what uh, has led uh, the people of the Gray to uh, its present situation. Uh, with regard to just uh, some uh, very few uh, human rights issues, I will take the DBV uh, findings, the gender-based uh, uh, violences. Tigray women were burned by chemicals and were killed during the assault. And gang, gang raping were the most common and most frequent form of sexual violence reported. On the average, a survivor is raped by four perpetrators, on the average. A maximum reported is 50 soldiers gang raped one survivor mother. Perpetrators were using different type of foreign objects other than their body parts of dehumanize, to dehumanize, humiliate, and intentionally harm survivors' productive organs. They even have cut the vision of survivors in some places. And uh, in one general hospital, only in one hospital reported in Southern Tigray, 500, among the 510, uh, uh rape cases reported to the hospital from them 1818 people uh, uh were tested hiv positive 323 uh, survivors uh, uh have tested uh, sexually transmitted diseases 166 were forced for abortion and 26 were forced to have uh, a delivery. So we can see uh, the impact uh, of uh, this GBV and other human rights violations on uh, the people uh, at every uh, uh, stage of uh, uh, the society. Now, let's see uh, the cost for justice and accountability and what way uh, uh, outcome we have. Uh, I think the international community, the Tigray government, the Ethiopian government have their own uh, roles and uh, uh, Ambassador Mike Hammer and uh, His Excellency Getacho Radha, President Getacho Radha, were uh, mentioning. So, implementation of the COHA or Pretoria Agreement uh, is the first one which should be uh, given emphasis uh, for me uh, to fully resuming constitutional order, which will allow the return of the millions of IDPs to their home, humanitarian aid healing and re rehabilitation as part of justice should be uh, taken very seriously. And this should be uh, in, uh, in line with further international investigation on the ground, which still uh, is not uh, done. Is the transitional justice a solution? Yes, it can be, but only for limited cases. As uh, President Getacho has said, uh, the Ethiopian federal government sponsored and dominated uh, transnational justice uh, one cannot be a solution uh, for this uh, problem uh, uh, because we have unimplemented preconditions of the Koha Pretoria Agreement, international nature of the atrocity, international actors, international uh, like Eritrean forces, which have committed uh, 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 in some areas uh, the largest uh, part of the atrocities, international trust and initial capacity, lack of capacity is there and victim survivors as a center in local participation is a principle in the transitional justice, but it is not yet done. So uh, we uh, seriously uh, uh, expect the international community, the Ethiopian government and the Tigray government to work hard in uh, bringing uh, a very independent investigation which can support uh, our uh, findings. And the Tigray diaspora community, uh, it is all said, uh, as President Getacho said, Continuing the all-sided campaigns and efforts uh, uh, on the cause of uh, the Tigray uh, uh, genocide is uh, the important uh, one that uh, is responsible. Uh, as uh, I have said, we still are working on different difficult situations. Uh, we have technical, logistical, and professional capacity gaps, and uh, I am sure uh, on next. Uh, similar sessions will have detailed presentation on this regard because uh, my team are also participating in this uh, session. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, detailed requests on uh, how we can collaborate with the diaspora and international community uh, on this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zarai, for the. Uh, thank you, uh, I'm sorry, Yamane, for uh, the excellent presentation. Uh, it's obviously, it's heart wrenching what has happened in Tigray. Uh, it's uh, painful, but uh, um, 
uh, the kind of documentation uh, you are doing, the kind of uh, information you're gathering, it's, uh, I mean, every detail you are picking, it will be very important for the future, ensuring justice and for history as well. So thank you so much uh, for the presentation. So now I go to uh, our next uh, guest uh, presenter, uh, Rita Kasai. Um, Rita's background is in uh, chemical engineering. She is a no, co no, it is Costino. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, okay, it's Christina. Okay, please, uh, can you go ahead? Okay, I will uh, introduce her. Uh, okay, it's uh, uh, gives me a great pleasure to speak uh, to you all this here. Uh, to welcome most cordially at the official opening of the first inauguration. Uh, uh, welcome everybody again. So we still have a long way to go <laughs> and only through a joint effort will be able to reach our fundamental goals. Uh, today, as you know, it's a peace building, transitional justice, full justice, Pretoria agreement and harnessing diaspora. So we will uh, please welcome Christina, a leaders advocacy team of HPN for Tigray. Christina, welcome. Welcome, Christina. Uh, if you tell me your uh, Zoom uh, name, I can uh, unmute you. Is it Christina S? Yes. Okay. I just send you to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Christina. I'm one of the team leads for advocacy for the Health Professionals Network for Tigray. Uh, the Health Professionals Network for Tigray is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization made up of volunteer members, most of which are medical professionals. And we advocate to the national and international policymakers and institutions for solutions. Uh, to the humanitarian crisis, um, access for humanitarian aid, and adequate access to Tigray, um, to healthcare in Tigray, uh, which many to this day, as you guys know, do not have. Uh, HPN's mission is to provide humanitarian assistance and life-saving medical services to underserved populations in Tigray, help advance access to healthcare and medical training through institutional partnership, education, mentorship, and advocacy. Uh, be the leading vessel for health professionals and institutions with mutual passions to improve healthcare and exchange expertise in Tigray and beyond. As a disclaimer, the information that I will be sharing with you is from uh, reliable sources that is readily accessible to the public. The views expressed today regarding transitional justice are not representative of the organization. Um, today, I was asked to speak on transitional justice and what it means as far as uh, it, the ways that it has or has not been implemented in um, Tigray. Transitional justice is a process used to respond to human rights violations. It aims to provide recognition and reparations to the victims. Uh, there are four pillars used in implementing transitional justice, truth seeking, prosecution, reparations, and institutional reforms. There are two measures that relate to transitional justice in Tigray. The first one is ICRI. ICRI is a resolution adopted on December 17th, 2021 by the Human Rights Council in which they established independent investigations by designating three human rights experts to conduct investigations of violations and abuses of international human rights and humanitarian laws, such as extrajudicial killings, uh, forced displacement, conflict-related sexual violence, mass massacres. They were also tasked with providing guidance on transitional justice. Specifically, they were required to include recommendations to the government of Ethiopia on ways to address accountability, reconciliation, and healing. Uh, the mandate was set for expiration and it was extended to October of 2023. Uh, in September of 2023, through the Health Professionals Network of Tigray and in collaboration with the Physicians for Human Rights, I spoke at the 54th regular session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The purpose was to urge for the extension of the mandate rather than to discontinue it. Ultimately, the EU decided not to submit the draft motion despite grave concerns from the commissioners and civil society organizations. Essentially, the EU and the US were more concerned with normalizing the relationships with Ethiopia. 
Some of the concerns that were expressed are reflective in the most recent report from the commissioners uh, that was released in October of 2023, in which the commissioners stated that conflict in Tigray has not ended with Eritrean troops and Amhara militias engaging in ongoing violations. Another quote from the report, um, the Ethiopian government has failed to effectively investigate violations and has initiated a flawed transitional justice consultation process. With ICRI being disbanded at this point, um, as well as the African Commission on Human and People's Rights inquiry into Tigray, there are no remaining international mechanisms for investigation to support justice and accountability. Uh, so while the investigations through ICRI were ongoing as part of the ceasefire agreement, which was signed in November of 2022, also known as the Pretoria Agreement, the government of Ethiopia was required to put forward a transitional justice policy that would address accountability and give justice to vic victims. Uh, however, because the government of Ethiopia itself has been implicated in human rights violations, civil society organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have expressed their serious doubts about the government of Ethiopia's plans for transitional justice. So now I'm gonna go into transitional justice. Uh, what are the mechanisms or pillars that were supposed to be implemented? Um, the first pillar is truth-seeking. Purpose of truth-seeking is to help victims find closure through revealing the details of human rights abuses they suffered in an official forum and through the establishment of truth commissions, whose purpose is to investigate what happened during the conflict and formalize their findings in an official report. Uh, another method that is also used as part of truth seeking is through memorials and museums uh, to tell society what happened and promote healing through honoring lives of victims, recognizing survivors of conflict related violence. In the case of Tigray, what we had as a mechanism of truth seeking was independent investigations into human rights abuses, conflict related sexual violence, forced displacement, extrajudicial executions through ICRI. Uh, before we get into the investigations, it is important to clarify that the mandate or ICRI did not give commissioners the duty or allow them to oversee prosecution for crimes that they were investigating. However, it was a vital to extend the mandate due to hindrance and pushback from the Ethiopian government, uh, preventing the investigation team from getting access to and speaking to victims in villages and towns like Mariam Dangalat, <laughs> Aksum, Ottawa, and Adigrat. The commissioners were essentially prevented from fully investigating accusations of conflict-related violence and the continued human rights violations that were occurring during the investigation in territories occupied by Eritrean forces, of which is reflective in the commissioners' reports. The second pillar is prosecution. Uh, criminal prosecution aims to hold individuals who ordered, planned, or per perpetrated crimes uh, responsible for their actions through criminal sanctions, such as fines and or terms of imprisonment. As there is no transitional justice system that has been implemented in Ethiopia to date that we know of, the information that I'll be providing is based on the January of 2023 draft up of policy options for transitional justice that was used uh, for potential stakeholders. In there, they recommended two options. Uh, one was to prosecute only those who ordered, planned, and instructed the Commission of Gross Human Rights Violations. So this would include um, army or military leaders, uh, individuals with leadership roles in the government. The second option was to prosecute those who committed human rights violations in any capacity. Uh, this would include those who committed extrajudicial killings, uh, conflict-related sexual violence, arbitrary arrests, forced displacement, attacks based on race, religion, or ethnicity. However, the caveat that the... Uh, Christina, you have about three minutes to finish, if you can oh. wrap it up in three minutes. Oh, okay. Um, okay, because uh, I was instructed that it was 20 minutes, so... Dr. Mugeta? No, we have to be uh, by 2015. We are going to move to the next one, if you can. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so then I'll go ahead and uh, get into the reparations. 
The third pillar is the reparations. When we think of reparations, what do we think of? Economic or financial compensation for damages or harm that has been done to a person. But in the context of transitional justice, it goes beyond economic compensation. It includes physical rehabilitation for victims, particularly those who are uh, victims of conflict-related sexual violence, providing them with psychological care, access to health care, access to education, access to social services, uh, providing guarantees that the violations themselves will not happen again. Uh, but to date, there have been no reparation mechanisms implemented for conflict-related victims. And then the final and fourth pillar is institutional reforms. Uh, reforms can be implemented in a variety of ways based on the needs for readdressability for victims, peace and reconciliation. Uh, legislative reforms are necessary to incorporate crimes against humanity into the criminal codes of Ethiopia. Uh, reforms within the justice system to help address human rights violations, including vetting of judges who may have participated in human rights violations themselves. Uh, structural reformation, uh, creating oversight bodies within state institutions to ensure that they are accountable to victims. Um, educating public officials, police, soldiers on applicable human rights laws and enforcing a no tolerance policy, addressing conflict related sexual violence by ending impunity, including women in these high level conversations, um, offering protection, safety net and creating a monitoring reporting mechanism. Um, and to finalize, I'll leave you with this quote, uh, never think that war, no matter how necessary, nor how justified is not a crime. Or Mrs. Hemingway. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, Mr. Peter Hagus. Uh, okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina, uh, for the excellent presentation. Thank you so much. So what do we have now? Do we, um, I think now we are into uh, the uh, <clears throat> discussion panel. So we have uh, we have our panelists here uh, of course uh, uh, we have uh, dr patrick white do we have dr patrick white oh uh, patrick i can uh, patrick is, white i can he is in the podium so uh, just find it ah, okay okay yeah, i found it uh, uh, patrick white is an executive editor at ethiopia insight and a lecturer at Ox okananga college in kalinawa british columbia he holds a phd in political science and the international development from the university of gulf canada he spent 18 months in Ethiopia between 2014 and 2019 while researching the South Sudan peace process. Dr. White, welcome. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you very much. Welcome. So, uh, thank you everyone for organizing this very important uh, panel. So uh, the main thing I want to talk uh, today about again is issues of transitional justice. So it's being addressed by other panelists in a uh, very comprehensive way. Um, of course, I don't have time to go over all of the human rights abuses that have been committed in Tigray and throughout the war in Ethiopia, but we all know that they're comprehensive and in many ways uh, constitute certainly war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. And when it comes to Tigray, I think there's a very strong argument to say that genocide was committed. So when it comes to uh, the academic literature on transitional justice, we have two uh, sort of broad approaches that are uh, put forward. So the first one is what's called um, survivor's justice. And the second one is what's called uh, criminal justice. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. White, sorry to interrupt you at the middle, but I also needed to, inter to introduce our another panelist, uh, Rita Kassai, just while, if you can hold a minute. Okay. Uh, you can continue. Uh, Rita Kassai is background. His background is in chemical engineering. She is a co-author in plan in plain sight, a book on uh, CR CR CF CRSV in Tigray, and the executive director of Irob Anina. Over the past three years, she has focused on gathering testimonies from victims of atrocity crimes and presenting their plight on many platforms. 
Brita lived in the refugee camps in Sudan that housed over 70,000 Tigrayans for a year and is now based in Tigray, continuing the same work. Rita, uh, please welcome and uh, for, uh, excuse me for the um, uh, for the omission, but uh, uh, again, uh, welcome. So please continue, uh, Dr. White, you can continue. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, let's uh, tell the, the audience that we plan to have three panelists. Uh, so one of them was Major General uh, Abdullah Jobe, but for personal uh, situations that happened yesterday, he was not able to join us today. So both panelists would have actual extra time to discuss mm -hmm. uh, the issues. And the way we set it up this uh, is they will uh, first comment on the two keynote presentations we have heard, and there would be followed up by a few questions, uh, prepared questions for them to address uh, before we go to a Q&A session to, to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the clarification. Please, Rita, uh, welcome. Rita, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, shall I let Patrick continue? Yes. Continue uh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. White, please Patrick, continue. Patrick should continue. Okay, yeah. So I had some remarks prepared about the transitional justice. I don't know if you want me to comment on the, the presentations first, but I had my uh, some remarks just generally about the approaches to transitional justice. I don't know if you want me to continue. Please go ahead. Okay. So as I was saying, in the academic literature, we have two broad approaches. So we have this idea of survivor's justice and the idea of criminal justice. So um, survivor's justice uh, essentially has the combination of uh, impunity for atrocities along with uh, also uh, political reforms. So uh, when we talk about, for instance, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, this is the approach that was taken. And there's a number of scholars that have made arguments in favor of this approach, uh, notably Mahmoud Mamdani. Uh, but there's also a number of criticisms of this. Obviously, all of the crimes that were committed during the apartheid era, um, during the TRC, essentially you had people admitting to the wrongs that were done, but then the slate was essentially wiped clean and all of the crimes done were never punished. So the second broad approach is the one that we've been talking about when it comes to Tigray, so the idea of criminal justice. Um, obviously, um, when you're talking about implementing a peace deal and having criminal justice at the same time, there's some complications when you're trying to combine those two at the same time. You have the same people that you're asking to form a transitional government. Also, um, you're also at the same time talking about prosecuting them. So in the case of Ethiopia, when it comes to the Praetoria Agreement, the idea has been that we're going to have a national system of transitional justice. And I think we're all aware of how problematic that is because the idea that the uh, Ethiopian government is going to be able to form credible uh, transitional justice, and especially when it comes to criminal prosecutions that involve prosecuting uh, its highest members and also its allies, I think is very unrealistic. We've seen the Ethiopian government shut down any attempts to try and investigate the crime. So when it comes, they were successful at petitioning the African Union to shut down its commission of inquiry. Um, they were successful at subverting the first UN um, inquiry by having the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission um, uh, sort of uh, be able to uh, join on and subvert it in many ways. And then uh, we had ITRI, which uh, its mandate has uh, ended recently, which was the most credible and important uh, um, form of uh, investigations. We also had Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which detailed many of the atrocities, such as the ethnic cleansing in Tigray, but they were prevented from actually being able to access uh, almost all of the uh, sites in Tigray. And this is the same case for journalists. So uh, when it comes to national forms of accountability, I think we're all rightfully skeptical that uh, the Ethiopian government will be able to do that. Obviously, knowing the nature of Isai Safworki's government in Eritrea, there's absolutely no hope that he would ever uh, even uh, put forward any kind of show uh, trials or um, sort of like even the facade of transitional justice. So as uh, President Geta Chureta said, this brings us to the international. And so um, there's a number of avenues that could be pursued, but I think um, the only way you're ever going to have credible uh, criminal justice when it comes to Tigray is if you have some form of international 
um, trials. Uh, there's a number of complications when it comes to that, though, specifically the fact that uh, Ethiopia is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court, the ICC. So this is uh, the main court that's charged with trying war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and crimes of aggression. And so given that Ethiopia is not a signatory to the ICC, all of the avenues are effectively blocked to having the ICC come in. But of course, we've seen that there's also the International Court of Justice, which could be another avenue. We've seen recently, just yesterday, there was uh, the determination when it comes to Israel and its actions in Gaza. Uh, we've seen the Gambia bring forward a case when it comes to uh, Myanmar and its uh, genocide of the uh, Rohingya minority. Uh, we've also seen uh, an ICJ case when it comes to Russia's crime of aggression and atrocities in, the, in Ukraine. So uh, we could say that the ICJ would be a much more, um, uh, it would be, the, the avenues are a lot more uh, realistic when it comes to having it some form of ICJ case. Uh, another avenue we could say would be, for instance, some sort of ad hoc tribunal. Of course, the ICC was created because uh, it was supposed to supersede the idea of having ad hoc tribunals. So in the 1990s, you had ad hoc tribunals on Yugoslavia, on Rwanda. Um, and so the reason the ICC was created was so that we don't, uh, we don't need to always be forming these ad hoc tribunals. But given that we have this consensus-based order, if a country like Ethiopia doesn't sign on to the ICC, it makes it very hard to actually prosecute them. Of course, one avenue would be the, uh, the UN Security Council bringing forward a case. We saw that when it comes to Sudan in 2005, when it came to, uh, when it came to Libya in 2011. Of course, getting consensus when it comes to the five veto powers on the UN Security Council is the big problem here. So we saw in Syria in 2014, we had China and Russia blocking them. I haven't seen any political will on the part of not only China and Russia when it comes to Ethiopia and Eritrea, but also when it comes to the United States, when it comes to France and Great Britain. Uh, we've seen consternation when it comes to defining what happened in Tigray as genocide. So they were very quick to accuse uh, Russia of committing genocide in Ukraine and China when it comes to Xinjiang. And those are very serious human rights abuses that make, need to be take ser taken seriously. But uh, I would question um, why. Uh, Tigray would not also qualify if those two cases do. Um, so uh, when it comes to the ICC, the UN Security Council could uh, potentially refer the case. But again, we've seen a lot of uh, consternation or we haven't seen a political will on that front. Um, so those are some of the main avenues when it comes to uh, international prosecutions. Again, I would say uh, it seems that the ICJ would be a good avenue. The other avenue that I forgot to mention would be through the African Union. So in South Sudan, um, there was a, a hybrid court that was uh, supposed to be established. So the 2019 uh, uh, RARCISS peace deal, the AU and the government of South Sudan, the transitional government, were supposed to establish a, um, a hybrid court. But what we've seen is that because uh, the AU did have the power to sort of override the government of South Sudan, but you're having the government led by Salva Kiir, who was responsible for a lot of the human rights abuses. One of his uh, vice presidents was Riyak Mashar on the opposition, who was responsible for human rights abuses. So the idea that they're going to form, again, they're going to be tasked with forming the transitional government, but also tasked with forming this uh, hybrid court that's meant to essentially prosecute themselves is somewhat unrealistic. And so you've seen the AU hasn't pushed. And also Salva Kiir has kept kicking the can um, further and further down the line. And you've seen the government of South Sudan be able to effectively prevent this hybrid court from ever actually being formed. So all that to say, there are avenues when it comes to international criminal prosecutions, but it's going to take political will on the part of actors like the African Union, or um, when it comes to, for instance, the UN Security Council, or bringing a case forward when it comes to the ICJ. And so far, uh, we haven't seen a lot of uh, or any action when it comes to that. My only hope is that they're giving time for the peace process to solidify, and that they're then going to pursue 
So, um, so more of a staggered process of peace and then justice. But the cynic in me thinks that uh, actually what we're going to see is that there are never going to effectively be um, international criminal prosecutions. And I, of course, hope that I am mistaken in that assessment. Uh, thank you, Dr. White. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Very informative. And um, I, I now uh, move to um, Rita. Uh, Rita, the floor is yours. Greetings, everyone, uh, wherever you are. I should start probably by... A little bit of voice. Uh, can, can you... A bit louder? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, of course. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, so I should start by thanking Professor Mulgeta and his team for uh, organizing such an important event, which I hope will be fruitful. Um, I echo what has been said so far, and we'll try to touch on all the themes as much as I can. Uh, so first, on peace building. Um, peace is obviously always welcome. Um, however, the efforts to build peace in Tigray have so far been very premature. I think they don't take into consideration the dire condition that our people are in. Um, as most of us are aware, the, there's looming famine in Tigray and there's still people suffering from starvation. As well as that, there are occupied areas across all of Tigray, Western Tigray, home to the majority of the refugees in Sudan, and the internally displaced people in Tigray is still completely occupied by Fano and Eritrean troops, leaving millions in a constant state of instability. Regions bordering Eritrea. Uh, excuse me, Rita. Can you can you can you make it louder a little bit, Rita? We can't hear you. Make it a little bit louder. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. <laughs> better. I know it is late on okay. here. Thank you. Perfect. It's okay. No problem. Um, so yeah, regions bordering Eritrea are still occupied. Um, where Eritrea has full administrative control over some areas. So 60% of Irob, for example, is still under occupation. And in these occupied areas, we have indigenous Irob children, grades five to eight, whose families and ancestors have fought for Ethiopia and have paid taxes to Ethiopia, who have never been Eritrean, going to school and being taught an Eritrean curriculum. Um, these are 14-year-old children that are being told they will be taken to Sawa, the Eritrean military camp, to give indefinite national service for Eritrea. In Irob, again, we have a significant amount of enforced disappearances. Irob Anina has documented more than 60 individuals who have disappeared since April 2023, six months after the peace agreement. People whose families were disappeared in 1998 still have no answers and are going through another round of anguish. To give you an idea of the terror this causes, just two weeks ago, I was in rural Glomachada going to see my grandparents um, and some of their goats made some noise in the middle of the night and everyone woke up in absolute terror, expecting that this is their turn to be taken by Eritrean troops. Um, we're still also receiving reports of sexual violence by Eritrean troops. All these factors mean that in occupied territories, there's still uh, not an end to war, really. Um, I don't want to move on from the peace building part without mentioning the refugees in Sudan, the people I lived with for a whole year who were stuck in another conflict. I was privileged enough to leave, but 70,000 of them are still completely forgotten, left without protection and essential services. So when we talk about peace building, we can't possibly be asking Tigrayans to shake hands and make peace with their neighbors and perpetrators when they're still living in terror, barely surviving. So that brings me on to the transitional justice. Um, as a few of the speakers have said, the drafted transitional justice policy is literally the fox guarding the hen house. Um, there are so many things wrong with it. Um, as President Getacho mentioned, I think one of the most dangerous aspects of it is the fact that the most heinous atrocities were committed by the Eritrean army. I could probably go as far as to say that more than half of the population of Tigray were made victims by Eritrean troops. So in the context of Irob, where 72 people were massacred on and around Christmas Day, women were held in sexual slavery, 
and people disappeared, these atrocity crimes were committed almost exclusively by Eritrean troops. The current policy doesn't include justice for these victims whatsoever. Um, since uh, members of the UN Human Rights Council, including the US, were so adamant, the Independent Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia's mandate end, an end without having without them having any access to actually fulfill their mandate. And since the responsibility has been given completely to the Ethiopian government to take over investigations and justice and accountability, and since the member states have turned a blind eye completely and took Ethiopia off the agenda, leaving it free to continue its atrocities on Tigray and across the country, we have to ask what remedies are there for these victims? Where were they considered when such harmful decisions were made? Um, as Christina mentioned earlier. So for full justice, uh, for the sake of upholding human rights and not perpetuating more violence, um, we need to recognize the failure of the UN Human Rights Council and the critical need for international independent involvement in justice and accountability. Um, and I know uh, pa Patrick just mentioned um, the difficulty in all of that. Um, but despite all the difficulties, um, we never expected that ICRI would be something that would be able to do. But the diaspora mobilized and did a lot to advocate for ICRI to happen. And it happened. It's something that we achieved. So through, uh, if we keep pushing, it's something that I think we, we will be able to, to attain. Um, international justice through the ICJ or the African court and so on. One other thing that Patrick, I think, had, didn't mention in terms of international justice would be universal jurisdiction. If there were states that were that had some form of uh, political will and we mobilized properly as the diaspora to to kind of trace the perpetrators, universal jurisdiction is something that we could potentially manage. As well as all this, it's really, really important that we make all our justice and uh, justice convenings as victim centered as possible. So um, conversations like this, victims should be included. Um, unless the victims themselves are remedied, we cannot have meaningful justice as a collective and peace will not be attainable. Um, but before all of this, we desperately need to address the dire humanitarian situation by pushing the government of Ethiopia. And I also have to say the interim government of Tigray to fully implement the Pretoria Agreement. We desperately need to emphasize on the withdrawal of Eritrean forces to Tigray's pre-war borders um, and to end, there has been obviously like a 15 month delay in executing the Pretoria Agreement and that has left civilians in Tigray suffering and eroding faith in any peace efforts. Um, so immediate action is really needed to prevent further atrocity, deaths and famine. Um, peace will come in turn, I think. So I'll end it there, thank you. Thank you, Rita, for the excellent presentation. Uh, thank you. And um, next, uh, Professor, uh, back to you. Oh. Yeah, th th thank you, uh, uh, Ayahagos. We call him Ayahagos, by the way. <laughs> His formal name is Mr. Peter Hagos Gebra. Uh, so I think that the next uh, part of this is. Um, really uh, the discussion part where uh, we have some questions, uh, not only to the two panelists, but also the presenters, uh, both the Amane and Sarim Manazarai and uh, Christina. So all of them are co-hosts and they can unmute when they have a question, uh, you know, coming towards them. So as you can see, uh, most of the questions, um, by the way, we are not giving we are not giving any chances, so don't raise your hands. Uh, we are we are going to summarize because there are thousands of questions that came through the chat. We are going to summarize and present them and just uh, be patient to hear if your question was mentioned. The thing is, most of these questions uh, were asked to either uh, Ambassador Mike Hammer or to President Gitacho. Uh But there are some questions that were uh forwarded to uh, Mr. Imane uh, from uh, the Tigray Genocide Inquiry Commission. Uh, so I will first start by asking um, Yamane, 
Thank you, by the way, for leaving information, your phone number, you know, because I see that there are a lot of people asking the questions and that you became accessible yourself to give more information by sharing your phone number. That is, you know, the height of transparency. So we appreciate that. So they are asking you this ba basic question uh, when I summarize it. Why is the Tigray Genocide Interior Commission um, not publishing its findings? Uh, why are you not sharing the data with the diaspora so that we can publish and you know uh, help us uh, uh, advocate for the justice of our people? Uh, Yamane, you can unmute and maybe share your thoughts. Um, and then I will go to the next question. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, my team members are also attending this uh, meeting and we are saving the questions uh, both for our commission specifically and also for uh, President Gitacho because we have also to work uh, on such issues, especially on the transitional uh, justice area. Uh, and I'm uh, very grateful for uh, this uh, co high concerns. Uh, so I am not to try to answer all the uh, things. Uh, as I have tried to uh, say on my presentation, we are working uh, on a very difficult uh, situation uh, in uh, getting uh, data. Uh, we uh, had, we were studying in uh, two different uh, sides. On the one hand, we decided to uh, have our jobs uh, be uh, scientific and internationally uh, with international accepted standards on the other hand we were working on a very closed and dark situation where we had no uh, telephone we had no internet we had no budget no, no transportation uh, uh, and no electricity uh, so uh, getting uh, such huge data uh, with uh, such international standard was a very difficult one so after bringing this uh, data from each locality, uh, phys getting there physically or bringing people physically from each cavalry to uh, our commission and getting uh, the proper uh, professionals, uh, proper uh, equipment to uh, even uh, just even extract, clean, organize and analyze uh, was a very uh, problematic uh, one. Uh, you know, uh, the problem is that we are working on, we were working for uh, more than a year uh, without any budget, any uh, material. Uh, even the computers that we had uh, couldn't carry uh, some of the data uh, that we have struggled uh, uh, on getting uh, and solving those problems. Uh, just one thing, uh, one uh, instructor, uh, professional from McCann University Business College told me, said to me, uh, I am poor technically actually on uh, such data. Uh, management. Uh, the, the damage assessment is damaging our computers, he, he claims, because uh, we were just uh, asking people to volunteer for, uh, to work hard for us. Uh, so that was one reason. Secondly, uh, we have to also strive uh, to go with even the political uh, ups and downs, uh, especially after uh the signing of uh, Pretoria agreement uh we ha we had no clarity on how to continue uh settings on how to uh continue uh, this work uh, as an institution because many of uh, uh my uh, professionals uh, working with with me with us were volunteers and uh they went to their life after uh, everything was opened so i have to uh, recollect we have to yeah. reconnect so, again. So, so for so, the sake of time, fine, I am now, gonna, just, for just the now, sake of time, okay. uh, hold yeah, on. Okay. So for the sake of time, because we are not going to have a, a long time uh, for this. So it is really more of a resource issue. Uh, I can attest to the fact that, uh, you know, it was like maybe seven, eight months ago, uh, we were approached by your office to help with actually, uh, you know, reading the data, cleaning the data and managing yeah. the data. So I can attest to that uh, challenge that you have. And if any of our diaspora communities here uh, 
have the time, the availability to help with resources like that, um, please do so. I have uh, our, uh, you know, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Kimfa Bishu here, and myself who are helping. So that resource issue, we have to help it. Uh, let me go to the next question, uh, Yamana. So one of the, I think, uh, you know, uh, good questions that came that I will forward to both Rita and Patrick is, um, th these are interrelated in a way. Is transitional justice possible without a political transition uh, in Ethiopia? Is one, I think Christina could have also addressed it, but maybe uh, she is leaving because of other uh, commitments. And also uh, after she, that... was trying, she was trying to be readmitted. I think she might have been, uh, she must have been out, so. Okay. No, that that was Rita. Hmm. The second yeah. question, if she is here, uh, she can, uh, you know, uh, unmute and speak on that. The second related question to both Patrick, uh, Christina, uh, and Rita is, can we find a country like South Africa uh, to sue uh, both Ethiopia and Eritrea, uh, you know, like they did with Israel? Is the other question that came. Uh, if you can comment on those, uh, I would appreciate it. Uh, Rita, let me start with you. Are you here? Uh, she was trying to get in back. Yeah. So, so Rita, uh, Rita is, you know, traveling uh, actually far, in, far away uh, in the Far East. So that may be the reason she is having trouble. So let me. No, go she's she's Patrick. still here. She's still here. She's trying to. She's on mute now. Yeah. Oh. Until then, Patrick, go ahead, please. Okay, Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll um, try to adjust the second question. I mean, I would actually um, like insights from other panelists and uh, people in the chat too, if they could think of a country that might be the good avenue. I know I'm Canadian, so I'll speak to Canada. Throughout this entire thing, I've been more than disappointed with Canada. So Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, um, his supposed foreign policy is this idea of like a feminist foreign policy, but throughout the war when um, um, you know, uh, the regional government has said something like 100,000 women in Tigray were sexually assaulted. Um, not only did Just Justin Trudeau not um, like fully criticize what was happening, he would have supposedly friendly chats with Abiy Ahmed throughout the uh, entire uh, war and the atrocities committed. Uh, and actually, there was a, finally nearing the, the at the end of the war, there was a parliamentary. Uh, hearing in Canada, and they heard all of the victims' testimonies. Uh, and I've heard that supposedly there was many people um, within the cabinet and uh, members of parliament were convinced that what happened in Tigray was genocide, but they were told not to use the word. So again, this politicization of the word genocide, because if you use it, then you have to act. So I mentioned before how uh, in a case like um, when it's Russia or China and they're enemy states of Western powers, it's very easy to uh, uh, say they're committing genocide because then you actually have license to like impose sanctions when it comes to Rwanda in 1994 or Ethiopia in the last few years, then you're actually obliged to act in situations where they don't want to. And so um, Canada has its mining companies have uh, economic interests in Tigray. When it comes to the US, at least you saw some criticism and you saw some actions like the AGOA, like taking Ethiopia, uh, uh, its stat AGOA status away. But now you've seen a return. And so, again, my, again, cynical view is that you're seeing economic interests and security interests in the region overriding um, the ability to pursue criminal justice. So I bring all this up because I'm like, I would say like so a country like Canada that historically has championed itself as like one of the founders of peacekeeping and human rights and all these things, which if you actually look into the record, it's obviously there's uh, a lot of hypocrisy in Canada's real record, same with the United States. Um, and so you'd think a country like Canada might be a good avenue, but I would actually say it's not. Um, so thank you, thank, thank you Patrick. Yeah. Thank you, I don't Patrick. know which country would be a good avenue, but I, I, I would like ideas from others. But Western powers, I'm, I'm pretty cynical about. Whether they yeah, would actually... let, let me go to Rita. Rita is back. So Rita, did you hear the questions? Yes, I think so. So the first yeah, one yeah. on... Yeah, go ahead. 
um, can there be transitional justice if um, if there is no transition in the government? I think um, there's, as Patrick said, there's victim justice. So when we come to the victims and all the victims that at least I have interviewed from Tigray have been adamant that justice is not should not be led by the current government. Because as I said earlier, um, it is like the fox guarding the hen house. So I would say no, um, transitional justice uh, should not be done by this government. Um, and then on the second question of which country, um, I think Ireland has shown um, quite a lot of principle when uh, it came to human rights, uh, not just in our context, but like even in the context of um, Gaza and, and, and things like that. I think in, in Ethiopia, it was the only diplomatic community that was kicked out um, during the genocidal war in Tigray. So um, that could be a significant, like it could be a good try, worth a good try. Uh, but again, all the countries want to normalize their relationships with Ethiopia. So it will require a lot of effort. Uh, is Christina back or no? I think she left. Uh, she texted me. Uh uh, Professor, I have a couple of points, if I may. Uh, uh, so we are we are running short on time. Just do it in one minute, Yahago. Okay. Yes, uh, I have one question to uh, uh, Yemana, and that is: uh, uh, Are you part of the interim uh, regional government? And uh, in that sense, uh, are you officially part of the government agency? And how do you balance your work with the federal government? Uh, that's one. And the other that goes with it is. How do you like, how would you like the diaspora, how would you like to engage the diaspora? You said you have resource constraints and all that. Do you have kind of areas you would say, these are the areas who would like the, the diaspora support? And for uh, Dr. White, my question would be, you said ad hoc tribunal would be the right uh, thing for, for Tigray. Uh, how can we achieve that? Uh, thank you. So you got you got to briefly answer them because we are running short of time. I will start with Yamana. You got two minutes, Yamana. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank he, you. he is here from Tigray, and it's probably past midnight. We appreciate your dedication, uh, but we have to wrap up on time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are government established uh, a commission, so now uh, the government has fully recognized us, and is all limited. We are budgeted for uh, the last few uh, months, and we are working uh, as part of the government. But we tried to uh, make our uh, work independent by uh, the standards that we put, the uh, standards, internationally accepted standards, and professionalism, not by uh, the initialization. Uh, that is one. Uh, we don't have uh, any direct relation with the federal uh, government. Uh, so just we are working uh, in uh, Tigray, so, uh, so uh, we still are also collecting data from uh, Tagarus uh, outside of Tigray, like uh, different regions uh, of uh, Tigray. Uh, on the support, I think uh, we have uh, to make it uh, a more detailed one for uh, next time because uh, we have to be systematic. We were just focusing on uh, uh, finishing the data that we have uh, at hand. Uh, and also some uh, gap filling uh, assessments. We have finished uh, data quality just last week uh, from 728 uh, MLS or uh, Tavias. So uh, next time we'll, be, uh, we'll come to you with uh, clear uh, uh, demands on uh, uh, how we can be uh, clearly supported. Thank you. Thank you, Amana. And Patrick? Okay, perfect, thank you. So um, when it comes to the ad hoc tribunals, actually, I think I would actually say probably the ICJ is the best route. Like you said, finding the right country would be the thing. So uh, when it comes to the AU or the UNSC referring the case to the ICC, in theory, those would be the best approaches. But politics are governing that that's not going to happen. When it comes to the ad hoc tribunals, like for Rwanda and Yugoslavia, those were very effective. But those were before the Rome Statute in 1998, so before the ICC was formed. And so the ICC was supposed to sort of supersede the need for an ad hoc tribunal. So you haven't seen really since the ICC was formed that you've had these ad hoc tribunals. But the problem being, of course, as I said before, the ICC being this consensus-based mechanism, the only avenues are either that uh, you have a, a state party 
that is referring itself somehow, or you have to be a state party to the ICC to be referred, or you have the UN Security Council uh, referring you. And so far, we've seen no uh, political will on the part of the UN Security Council. So given all of that, and again, seeing no political will on the part of the African Union, I would say finding some country like uh, South Africa when it comes to Gaza or the Gambia when it comes to Myanmar to bring forward a case would seem to me to be the most effective avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Rita, do you have anything to add to that? Quickly, one minute. Okay, maybe Rita is having uh, uh, an unmuting problem. Uh, so as, as we uh, move along uh, our program, I, I think before that, I would like to shout out really uh, to our uh, <clears throat> long time, uh, you know, Tigray's friend, uh, Gail Warden has been here with us for a while. Thank you so much for joining us, Gail, Miss Gail Warden. And also my dear friend uh, who has been really, uh, you know, the backbone of my work with the American Public Health Association in conferences and all, Evie Chiro is also here. Uh, Evie, can we see your, uh, your picture? She has been really, really uh, an amazing uh, supporter of our work, uh, writing, uh, documenting policies of, you know, um, and reviewing uh, anything that I do about Tigray. And her heart is in Tigray, really. Uh, she, you know, yesterday when I wrote to her, she said, I wish I go with you uh, to Tigray and do something. But uh, she has um, surgery at some point, so she has limitations uh, in her movements. But thank you so much to see you here, uh, Evie. Uh, she, she is a dear friend. And also shout out to everyone. Um, from Tigray, who joined us. I mean, it's very late in Tigray, as you know. Uh, and, you know, taking your time, taking your Saturday from family time to join us for this very, very important conversation uh, is really, uh, we are very grateful. And this, this you know, as we said, uh, this is the first. Uh, and, you know, you will see us coming back with similar, more, uh, I, I think, provocative and more. Um, uh, organized uh, programs, uh, workshops, and seminars, uh, as we indicated in our goals, as well as uh, our objectives. Now, <clears throat> I think the last important thing, uh, one of our founding members, Archpriest uh, uh, Musi Berha, uh, is he our, our co-host, uh, Ephraim? Yes. He's a yeah, he, uh, he will be he will be making uh, some uh, closing remarks. Uh, are you ready, uh, Lika Kahanat? I am. You have five minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to do some remarks, closing remarks, and also. I would like to thank Liga Kahanat. Can you can you wait one second? Sorry, uh, we we need to introduce you. So Archpriest uh, Musi Barha uh, has been really also part of uh, our advocacy efforts for so many years uh, that since I knew him. But more importantly, the last three years we have been working together. He has a lot of connections uh, with um, policymakers, but he is a father. And he has been to Tigray and was there for two months supporting uh, what is going on in the, with the humanitarian crisis, uh, with people suffering from PTSD, uh, and you know doing healing services uh, for the veterans of Tigray. Uh, so he, he is uh, also uh, a treasurer, although we don't have money yet. He is our treasury uh, of the PJT International. So I just wanted to say that first, uh, Archpriest uh, Musi. Go ahead now. Well, thank you for the kind uh, introduction, uh, Professor uh, Mulugeta, our president. And thank you for your tireless work for making this uh, event possible. Uh, you worked day and night and you made it. And thank you for all those, uh, President Gita Cho, uh, Ambassador Mike Hammer and colleagues and the presenters. 
panelists, medias, attendees, we cannot have any leverage without you. And thank you so much for making it a day of mission and message. We are talking here about the obstacles of peace and justice. I can say and hope the greater obstacles will be the greater potential outcome for Tigray. We should feel not shy to work with the religious leaders for peace and justice because we can find the location of peace and justice closer to the house of God than anywhere else. Who and what are we? Did you ever start to question? What is our basic makeup? What is our substance? What essential elements are we made, uh, made of? The answer is, we are the likeness of God. We are part of God. We are the image of God. We are the word and flesh of God. Let us check what the prophet Amos said about peace and justice and how he revitalized and realized peace and justice. Amos 5, 24, let justice run down like water, the righteousness like a mighty stream. It is easy, it is easy to separate our religious ceremonies from the way we treat others and to take what God should be happy if we give him his due without regard to justice and righteousness toward others. God won't have it. When we are talking about peace and justice, they are woven into the very fabric of our life. Therefore, we talk about peace and cannot divorce justice from peace. And justice is a tenant of the substantial and sustainability of peace. Mika 6, 8 tells us that first, what essential required of us to, to do. Three points, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. The Lord answers the contentious witness to, in open court. What requires of us isn't complicated. He has shown us in Micah 8, 6, 8, the prophets imagined a courtroom. God stopped the shouting of the angry defendant from the witness box. God essentially said, you act as if what I require of you in some mystery. In fact, it is not mystery at all. He shown us clearly what is good to make peace and to be at peace is to act justly. So God is not only God of peace, but he is also a God of justice for his image bearer. Justice cannot be done miraculously. It requires a formula of action. In our duty, we simply need to do these three things. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. He wants us to remember who he is. He's our creator. He's our God. If we keep that in mind, we will walk humbly before him. We will make peace and live in justice. We are not talking here about condensing, condensing simple matters, but we are talking about peace and to give justice for God's image bearer. If of men and women in our generation, in the Giz language in our Orthodox daily prayer, it said, in roughly translation to and the, the greater the problem requires a greater solution and outcome is great, greater and brighter. When we translate this into Tigray's measureless genocide events, not only justice need to be served as our God asked us to act justly. I think our God want, would want us to work for the greater cause of Tigray so that the same events will never ever occurred again. What would be the fate of Tigray after this genocide? Justice is not only compensation for the victims by the genociders, criminals for the current generation, but it should give us the wisdom and knowledge not to wait 
for another cycle. We are racing against time. Time is the distance between cause and effect. Time is the separation between action and reaction. Time is the space between activity and the repercussion, like the divide between crime and consequences. So Tigrayans and friend of Tigrayans, we have no time to waste when our citizens are perishing every day by double genocide and lamenting on the street of Tigray. Overall, whether we believe in God or not, we all need to carry with us that we are entitled to be the anchor of peace and justice. The creator God is a God of justice. The creator God who created all humans in his likeness is a God of peace and justice. The creator God who labored to make men and women in his image to continue multiplying in this universe is a God of peace and justice. The creator God is a God of freedom for all, including Tigrayans and Tigray. Therefore, Tigray is longing for peace, justice, and freedom. With the blessing of God, with the help of yours, eventually God will allow Tigray to prevail and bring freedom home, delivering the painful justice and freedom at last. May God bless you and thank you and take the message, act in it, and help the people of Tigray and surrounding. Thank you. Thank you for that very, very um, important closing message, uh, Archpress Musi Barha. Uh, we thank you very much. So I think we are concluding on time. Like we said, we will start at one and we will end at three or five. It is three or four. So the last message we would like to pass as you uh, go home uh, is, so we are PJT International, Peace and Justice for the Grants International. We are a 501c3. If you would like really to join uh, in our mission uh, to one, as individuals, you can join us. You can partner with us if you are organizations. Uh, here are really the things we are trying to accomplish uh, in, you know, in the coming uh, short months. Uh, they are very defined. And we told you about our mission. So we are really, everything we do, we know it needs to harness, you know, the multifaceted expertise and experiences of the diaspora. So we really want you uh, to call us, uh, to reach us out. We are on Twitter, PJT Inter is our handle. We have an email, PJT, I-N-T, PJT International at gmail.com. So actually, PJT Int 23 at gmail.com. So these are ways uh, for you to connect with us, uh, to, to join us. As you can see, this is not a by name only international conference. Even though it's our first conference, it's a truly international conference where it brought people from Canada, from Tigray, from the US, from Europe, even Rita Haftana is in, I think, Thailand or somewhere. So Canada, US, Tigray, all over Europe people uh, are, are here. So it is a truly international uh, conference. And we are so glad that you were able to make uh, your Saturday, uh, I, I think a meaningful Saturday because uh, we are talking about something meaningful, peace and justice for Tigra and beyond. I think we talked about the pass forward. The pass forward is for us to come together, to work together, to achieve this mission of peace and justice uh, and, and in Tigra uh, and beyond. I think with this message, uh, I would like to thank again my colleagues, uh, Ephraim Mesfin, you can see him right there, smiling with his glasses, who has been tirelessly working uh, the technical issues and introductions. And my good friend, uh, also Peter Hagos Gevra, who is our secretary, who has been doing all this fantastic job. And the same thing with uh, Archpriest Lydia uh, uh, Kanat Musay, uh, who has done also a tremendous job connecting us. Uh, 
with so many influential people. We are sorry that uh, one, uh, one of our panels was not able to make it. We could have heard uh, you know, his perspective from the regional politics, regional conflict resolution uh, perspective. Uh, but that would be for next time. As we said, this is the first, not the last. So see you next time. Uh, thank you so much again. Bye-bye. Have a nice Saturday and Sunday. God bless all of you. See you next uh, in the next event. Good to see you, Evie. Good to see everyone, friends. Family, good right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.